Hello and welcome to this edition of the DDM's Focus Program. I am your host, Viona Alexander-Smith, Information and Education Manager at the DDM. In this edition, we will highlight the impacts of droughts on Caribbean islands and what can be done to minimize drought effects. Fortunately for the BVI, the drought outlook issued by the Caribbean Climate Outlook Forum, valid up to the end of May this year, indicates that the territory is in a no-concern area for a drought. However, a drought watch or warning has been placed on other Caribbean islands. Although the territory is not in a water warning zone, the DDM believes it's important for our residents to be informed about this hazard, especially since, according to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization's 2016 Drought Characteristics and Management in the Caribbean report, climate change is expected to increase the intensity and frequency of droughts in the Caribbean. With these predictions, the BVI and other Caribbean islands must prepare for future droughts. In fact, the region has experienced drought conditions in the last few years. The 2009-2010 drought in the Caribbean was regarded as the worst in over 40 years. This was followed by the 2014-2015 drought, which went on record as the driest year for the Eastern Caribbean with several islands being placed under drought watch or warning. Some of the islands declared water emergencies and had to implement water conservation and rationing measures. A drought watch was also implemented for the BVI during that time, as the territory noted a significant reduction in rainfall during the first half of 2015. Only 3.5 inches of rain was recorded between January and June 2015, compared to 13.5 inches during the same period the previous year. The drought conditions which were experienced in 2009-2010 and 2014-2015 in the region are very different to the seasonal dry season or dry spell which the region normally experiences. In a previous Focus interview, Adrian Trotman, agrometeorologist and Chief Applied Meteorology and Climatology at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology in Barbados, explained the difference between drought and dry spells. He also provided additional information on drought conditions. What is the difference between a dry spell and a drought? They both speak to dryness in a relative sense, you know was drier than we expect or was drier than normal. You know, we have some parts of the world that are always dry. We call them deserts or semi-arid to arid areas, let's put it that way. They're always dry. Uh, but drought is when you're dry relative to what you expect in your country in this case. Drought is about relative dryness and abnormal dryness. But drought typically speaks to a prolonged period of dryness and uh, some may go further to say a prolonged period of dryness that leads to water shortages whereas a dry spell we don't talk about a, a very short period a short period of dryness so you got you can have many dry spells within a drought you can have a dry spell within a very wet period right so you normally talk about a short period of dryness when you talk about dry spells and drought is a more prolonged period of dryness. As I said, possibly leading to a water shortage and it can lead to disaster. Now, if a drought watch or warning has been issued for a particular place, does it mean that there will be absolutely no rainfall during that drought period? Not at all. You can get rainfall every day in a drought. And it could be that if you're getting a drought, as I indicated earlier, such that it's causing water shortages, you can have a, a limited amount of rainfall every day. It doesn't mean zero rainfall at all. It means a reduction in rainfall or deficit in rainfall relative to what's average, what's normal, whatever you want to use, whatever phrase you want to use here, or word you want to use here. It's a deficit in rainfall. And it's a recognizable deficit that you start to see impacts in your environment. For example, agriculture, 
you start seeing the reductions in water levels in your rivers, in your streams, in your reservoirs. Uh, and once it's extended even further and the time, and the time goes on, that the, the duration of the drought becomes really long, you start seeing reductions in groundwater in your aquifers and so on. It doesn't mean that there's no rain. It means there's, a, there's much less rain such that it causes these kinds of impacts. It doesn't necessarily mean zero. That was Adrian Trotman, agrometeorologist and chief applied meteorology and climatology at the Caribbean Institute for Meteorology and Hydrology in Barbados. Stay tuned to Focus. We'll have more information on droughts after this commercial break. The Department of Disaster Management is located at number 3 Whaling Road, McNamara, Tortola. Our mission is to protect lives and maintain a resilient, stable economy and society by fostering comprehensive disaster management and climate change adaptation as a way of life. For all your disaster management needs, contact the Department of Disaster Management at 468-4200 to speak with one of our knowledgeable staff. That's 468-4200. Or you can visit our website at www.bviddm.com. We're also on Facebook and you can follow us on Twitter. The Department of Disaster Management, your life-saving connection. Welcome back to Focus. In this edition, we are highlighting droughts and their impacts. Earlier, I spoke about the 2014-2015 severe drought in the Caribbean, which saw Caribbean islands experiencing water shortages and serious impacts to the agricultural sector. This video clip from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society recaps what occurred just two years ago and its implications on the Caribbean. They have forecasted that the coming years, would, the coming months, would be very dry. And this would, <laughs> it's not good news for us, especially here in St. Kitts. We have been battling with drought-like conditions for the past six to eight months. Yeah, so in living memory, the worst drought in the Eastern Caribbean, at least, has been one in 2009, 2010, so only five years ago, five, six years ago. However, it seems like this year, maybe of the same intensity or even worse in terms of the coverage in the Caribbean. So we already see uh, losses in agriculture, for instance, in Western Belize, running into the millions of dollars. We see losses in productivity in Antigua and in, um, in St. Kitts. We see water uh, being a challenge in Puerto Rico, uh, where, for instance, San Juan would have had parts of the city which only got water every second day, parts only every third day. But that is not just in Puerto Rico. That's also the case, for instance, in Antigua, which in the month of September um, had homes that had access to water only once every sixth day. The chief economic uh, activity here would be agriculture and tourism. Drought would be a serious, serious thing, impact for agriculture, of course. You won't be able to plant crops. And even if you plant them, then you're not looking, for, looking at any good yields. And then tourism. Most of the ships that come to our shores, they, they expect to get some water from us to move on to the other ports. Because of the drought, we have had to restrict our ration water and we lessen the quantity that we give to the, uh, the, the, the ships. Some of them have you know, threaten that if they don't get the quantity that they need, then they may not be making St. Kitts Nevis another stop on their itinerary. So the drought, yes, serious impact for us here in St. Kitts. Now one particular problem for the uh, people's awareness of drought is that as the second part of the wet season came in, we finally started seeing some rains, which happens even if we're in a year of drought. What does that do? Well, it alleviates the drought problem at the surface. So that means that the vegetation turns green. We start seeing the biological life happening again the way it usually does. And so people forget about the drought problem. But the point is, even if in those months we get normal rainfall, we still overall for the whole wet, um, wet season, we accumulated less fall, rainfall than uh, is required to refill our, our water reservoirs 
to recharge our uh, aquifers, etc. So that means that we get into the dry season already with too little water. And now comes the season in which all the tourists are coming, in which the agriculture uh, re requires more water for uh, irrigation, in which there is more water requirements for uh, bushfire fighting, and in which, in general, there's more evaporation, so the, the, the ground surface also dries out much faster. Welcome back to this edition of Focus on Droughts. Before the break, we highlighted the implications of droughts on various sectors and the environment. But there are also health issues that arise during drought periods. These health issues brought on by excessive heat are often seen in our vulnerable groups, the elderly and the children and individuals in certain professions. Medical Officer of Health in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Ronald Georges, speaks about the health issues that can arise and provides advice on how we can stay healthy. Dry and hot conditions, we are in the Caribbean, you know, and we are pretty close to the equator. Um, so yes, these happen from time to time. Uh, so from time to time as well, you know, the, the kind of problems that we can have when we have dry and hot conditions include things like um, heat stroke, Mm -hmm. heat exhaustion, dehydration, because of course in these conditions you'll be losing a lot more water than okay. um, in other conditions. Other things that can happen, you know, some people are pretty sensitive to the, to the heat and to the sun and they can develop some rashes. Okay. Um, also during these times, times we may also have a lot of dust and again people with respiratory conditions or allergies may be affected as well. Okay, what are some of the signs and symptoms we should pay particular attention to? Right, so you have like a grad gradation from uh, heat exhaustion, de dehydration, heat exhaustion, and then you can get to heat stroke. So heat stroke would be your, your most severe mm -hmm. um, type of um, health effect from, from um, heat. Um, it's basically a, a situation where the body temperature is pretty high, it's going to be over 105 degrees um, Fahrenheit, about 40.5 degrees um, centigrade. Um, in, this in this type of condition, of course, the body system is not going to really be functioning properly. So one of the, one of the you know, severe symptoms could be like confusion, um, it can be as bad as seizures, mm -hmm. um, loss of consciousness. Um, persons may have other symptoms, you know, thirst, um, they may be flushed. If mm -hmm. it's a person who's light skinned, you may see they're very red mm -hmm. um, and they're not sweating, you know, they're, they're, they're hot to the touch. Um, other things like dizziness, nausea, you know, neurological type symptoms can, can also occur. And um, it's basically caused because of the high temperatures, the body is no longer regulating itself properly. And it's usually also complicated by dehydration. Right. Mm -hmm. And when these symptoms are observed, what action should be taken? Right. So if someone is in heat stroke, it's, pretty, it's a medical emergency. Okay. So basically that person should be immediately removed from the, the exposure. So if they're in the, in the sun, they should be taken to somewhere where they're shaded, or if there's an air-conditioned area nearby, that can be done. Um, the immediate thing, of course, you want to call 911, get the health, um, some kind of you know, the health authorities involved. Uh, if there's you know, a physician nearby, you can be summoned. But the immediate action will be to bring that temperature down mm -hmm. to a safe level, and that can be done quickly by taking the clothes off um, in a shaded area, wetting the person down. Um, and fanning them. So when the water evaporates, it takes heat with it, mm -hmm. so it can um, reduce the temperature. Um, you can also do things like put ice packs in the, the armpits and the groin, um, but you know, this will be for very severe um, cases. Okay, mm -hmm. and why in those particular areas? Right, because those areas have a lot of blood flow. Okay. So a lot of blood coming to the surface, um, and by cooling that, you can be a little more effective in reducing the core body temperature. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Okay, you spoke about the heat stroke aspect of it, but in terms of dehydration, what can persons do? Right, so dehydration is a much, much milder um, mm -hmm. than heat stroke. And simply by drinking lots of fluids, okay. right? You know, we always recommend you drink eight glasses of water, eight ounces, eight times. When it's hot, you may want to increase our frequency. And quick, easy rule of thumb. If your urine is very dark, then obviously you're a bit dehydrated. So you'd want to drink enough water so that when you pass urine, it's clear. Right. Mm -hmm. I know that there are some persons who, because of their profession, they are constantly exposed to sun. What extra measures can these people take to protect themselves? Right. So you have folks who work in the marine industry who may be out in the sea. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's very little opportunity for shade if you're in an open boat um, or if you're working on a boat. And you have those in the construction industry as well. Right. 
Um, so obviously drinking lots of water. So there should be lots of cool water available and they should, they should drink water freely. Um, things like, simple things like um, sunscreen to affect the, to prevent those kind of issues. Covered, you know, you, you cover yourself as much as possible, broad hats, that kind of thing. Um, but generally speaking, you want to make sure you're drinking a lot of fluid. I mean, at this point, I'd like to just bring up some other folks who might be at risk. Okay. Um, young children, right, okay. under four. Um, they, again, you have to take special precautions with them. The elderly, or those over age 65. Those with chronic diseases, things like diabetes, hypertension, renal disease. People who may be on prescription medication, such as diuretics, um, psych and, uh, psychiatric medications, other medications like that. They may actually be at higher risk. So special precautions should be taken to make sure that, you know, to reduce their risk. Um, elderly who may be shut in at home, you know, during the day most of us might be in air-conditioned offices or out and about, and they may actually be in a, in a home that where the temperatures can get pretty high. So, you know, special precautions to make sure that they are able to be cool and um, well hydrated at all times. That was Medical Officer of Health in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Ronald Georges. Drought conditions can also affect our pets, for example, as it relates to dogs. Owners may notice an increase in ticks in dogs. This is because the brown dog tick increases dramatically with warmer weather and droughts. Now, it's absolutely important that we do not wait until a drought watcher warning has been issued to start conserving water. Even in the agricultural sector, irrigation systems can be used to control the amount of water plants are receiving and to minimize waste. Irrigation is also an effective way to promote plant growth during periods of low rainfall. And of course, there are other water conservation methods we can utilize in our everyday life. Director of the Water and Sewage Department, Perlene Scatliff, shares some of the water conservation methods. In conserving water, we need to be mindful how we are using it, yes? It's basically how we are using the water and what we can do to eliminate or avoid or decrease the use of such water. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give some examples. When we are washing dishes, as opposed to having the water run, while you're washing and rinsing, mm -hmm. um, run water in dish pans or run the water in the zincs or something and, you know, do your, your, um, your washing there. Um, if you can, as much as possible, and I, let, I know we like our modern, modern um, appliances, you have dishwashers and, and so forth, so if you can avoid doing that, you know, um, avoid it. But if you cannot, at least, you know, wait until the dishwasher is a bit full before you do it. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one area. We, we all like to, especially the very the M BMWs and mm -hmm. all the very fancy cars and, and so forth, um, as opposed to strictly using a hose to clean the car, grab a bucket, fill that bucket with whatever you need to, to get your car clean and, um, and spiffy, um, mm -hmm. you know, get it scrubbed down and then hose it down, as opposed to washing down the lawn, the, the, um, the walkways and so forth, sweep it. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the um, techniques that we, or the practices that we would encourage persons to um, utilize when we, you know, when they want to conserve water. Another area we find um, we've come across quite a bit at the water and sewage department, um, persons with high bills, etc. Um, the bathroom. The bathroom is one of the um, most common areas where persons lose a lot of water specifically the toilet mm -hmm. okay you we lose a lot of water in the toilet because the devices in the tank itself they go bad and sometimes people are not even aware that something has gone bad in the tank until they actually get a plumber in to check mm -hmm. and yes that's where the problem is mm -hmm. so do, do not wait until there's a problem to to check your appliances, to check the zinc, to check the pipe walk in the kitchen and in the bathroom to make sure that everything is functioning, that you have no leaks, etc. because that's, that's an area for water loss and is not contributing to our conservation efforts. I remember when this beach was really wide, a place to picnic and play cricket. Mm, 
and we used to go up to the end to get away from all the people. Now all the beach gone. Coastal erosion. When the sea starts to come in and take the land away, everyone loses something. Granny, look how the waves are washing right under that house. Coastal erosion. It's a hazard. Hazards. Take control. Reduce your loss. What can you do to help stop coastal erosion? For one, don't drive four-wheel vehicles on seaside dunes. They loosen sand and destroy binding vegetation, causing erosion. Find out more about coastal erosion and other hazards at your local disaster office. Welcome back to Focus. Remember, the Caribbean region is being encouraged to fast-track efforts, implement policies, and prepare for increased droughts due to climate change. Let us all do whatever we can to minimize the risks associated with droughts. Thank you for tuning in to this edition of Focus. I am Viona Alexander-Smith, Information and Education Manager at the Department of Disaster Management. Join me next time for another edition of Focus on CBN Television and on 90.9 FM. You can also follow us on bviddm.com and Facebook and Twitter at bviddm for constant updates and information.